Welcome to a new episode of the Mahdisi Street Podcast. Uh, my name is Usama Mahdisi, and I'm joined as always by my brothers, uh, Sadi. Uh, Sadi, Hello. it's good to see you again. Hello, everyone. And my brother, Karim, in Beirut. Karim, it's great to see you again. Karim, you're on mute. Hi, everybody. Yes, hi, yeah. everybody. <laughs> uh, we're delighted to, to have with us one of the most distinguished Palestinian liberation theologians of our time, Dr. Mitri Rahib, uh, as our guest today on Mahdi Sitri podcast. Um, Dr. Mitri is the founder and president of Dar al-Kalima University in Beit Lahem in Bethlehem. He holds a doctorate in theology from Philips University at Marburg in Germany. He is, more importantly, the author and editor of around 50 books, including the most recent book, Decolonizing Palestine, The Land, The People, The Bible, which was published by Orbis Books uh, this year. And I highly, highly recommend our listeners uh, and viewers to uh, get this book. He is a founding member and board member of the National Library of Palestine, and he's an elected member of the Palestinian National Council. Reverend Dr. Rahib received in 2022 an honorary doctorate of divinity from the Wartburg Theological Seminary, and in 2017, he received the Tolerance Award from the European Academy of Science and Arts. In 2015, he was awarded the Olaf Palme Prize. And in 2012, the German Media Prize was given to Dr. Rahab, although I'm not sure in today's climate if he would have received any of these prizes. Because more than anything else, Dr. Rahib is a person of courage. He's a person who exemplifies what is most beautiful, I think, and we think, about the ecumenical Palestinian experience, about uh, he exemplifies and embodies a, a, a wider Arab Christian tradition that often gets neglected when we talk about the history and the politics of the contemporary Middle East. So, Dr. Mitri, uh, welcome again to our show. We're, we're delighted to have you. If you could just tell us a little bit at the beginning about your, you know, the, your experience especially what's going on now in, in Gaza, in, in Bethlehem, where you are, in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, all across Palestine. Just give us a sense of what's happening. Yeah, actually, uh, these days are uh, the most difficult days, I would say, in my entire life. Uh, I never, ever experienced something like, like what we are experiencing nowadays. Let me start with Gaza. Um, um, I mean, what we experience there is a genocide. Uh, over 20,000 people have been uh, murdered, over 50,000 people injured, uh, over 1,700 massacres uh, uh, done there. Um, uh, hospitals, most of them are out of service, uh, uh, damaged. Uh, schools were destroyed, over 150 mosques. Uh, and even uh, the Christian community was heavily targeted. Uh, Three percent of the Christian population in Gaza was murdered in Israeli strikes. Uh, uh, five uh, Christian institutions in Gaza were attacked by Israeli airstrikes. Wow. But for me, uh, you know, this sounds like numbers, but for me it's also personal because uh, Dar al Kalima University uh, is uh, the only university in the West Bank with a satellite program and the center in Gaza. Uh, so we have students there, we have staff there. Uh, and, you know, uh, every day when I woke up, uh, I look at my uh, mobile to see who is still alive, uh, to hear just a sign that they are still there. The director uh, of uh, our uh, satellite program, a young uh, Palestinian accomplished artist, from Gaza uh, had to be evacuated, is displaced now in the south with her family. Rana is her name. Uh, she is like in her uh, late 30s, uh, very active, liberal, uh, uh, great artist. Uh, we lost four of our staff and volunteers, uh, artists, uh, three women and one man. The young man, uh, uh, Mohammed Sami, uh, he is actually a performing artist. He was uh, uh, volunteering uh, at the Ahli Hospital, which is uh, the Anglican hospital there, a Christian hospital, uh, to bring some calm and joy to the kids who were frightened and, uh, you know, traumatized in the hospital with their parents. 
Um, and actually, while he was singing with them, uh, a, sing, uh, a song about peace, uh, teaching them that song, uh, there was an airstrike and he died and the children died in that uh, airstrike. Um, uh, thinking of Halime, another uh, uh, artist, the visual artist, uh, uh, she and her entire family were murdered in an Israeli airstrike at their home. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I still see her uh, two years ago after the last war on Gaza, uh, how uh, she was actually working with kids to do art therapy. So we are missing uh, all of these uh, volunteers and, and people that we came to love and uh, to cherish. And we have over 300 uh, students in Gaza. We have no idea uh, who is alive still, who is death, dead who is displaced, uh, what's what's happening uh, to them. You know, one of our uh, uh, staff, uh, uh, um, he had to be separated from uh, uh, his wife. They were newly uh, married, uh, but his wife has uh, a, a foreign passport. And uh, so they got, uh, could get her out of Gaza while he's stuck there and and, you know, just to see how, how, you know, that moment at Rafah crossing where they had to say goodbye to each other, knowing that they might not see each other uh, again. So, so, you know, it's these personal stories that really, uh, for me, touch, uh, touch our hearts and, and, and shows the depth of the tragedy that we are experiencing there. Uh, thinking of the Christian community, same story, you know, I mean... Uh, just last uh, Saturday, uh, an Israeli sniper uh, killed uh, an older woman in her 70s with her daughter inside the Latin Holy Family compound while they were just crossing within the compound to go to the restroom. Uh, and the sniper just, uh, you know, shot to kill. And both of them were killed on the spot. And when uh, the other Christians, the community wanted to uh, to rescue them, uh, uh, Israel sent a missile, missile uh, and 10 uh, Christians in that compound were injured. And, you know, I, I, I know the people there. I talk to them every day. And so it's really heartbreaking. Now, coming to the West Bank, it's not much, much, much better uh, because in the, in the West Bank, uh, Israel is bombarding on daily basis. Uh, also, certain cities, especially in the north, uh, every day uh, they uh, enter into Bethlehem to detain young people. So within these 75 days, over 3,000 young Palestinians were detained in the West Bank and are in Israeli prisons. And you know now the Israeli prisons, they compare them with the uh, um, uh, Guantanamo. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Guantanamo. Guantanamo. Yeah. Gu Gu yeah. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, the, being in Bethlehem, you see the uh, the wall surrounding the city from three sides. You see 22 Jewish colonies taking 86% uh, of our land. So we have only 14% of our land under our own control. So Bethlehem has become like a native reservation, uh, basically. And this actually shows uh, the, uh, the settler colonial uh, uh, aspect of the Israeli state. So, Doctor, uh, so Mitzvah, I mean, when you when you, it's it's actually horrifying what you what you're describing. It, honestly, it's it's so for for me, of course, it's it's monumentally evil in, in a sense. It's so difficult to 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 even respond to something like this. So, my question is, and I guess our question is, what is the the how do how does one cope and how does one respond to this right away? I mean, how do you keep going is one question, and then how does it how does it relate to how do you how do you tell people who are, for example, in the West who are reading the Bible and who are, you know, thinking of themselves as as good people, for example, how how do you translate this experience that you're going through, that you're witnessing, to the reality uh, to to their reality? So, for example. Karim and I were discussing earlier these stories of the Bible that are familiar to a lot of people here, but 
that they have no connection whatsoever to the reality that you're experiencing. So I'm just trying to understand. So how how do you respond at a personal level to this sort of the depravity that we see and that you're seeing and witnessing? And then how do you translate this to people who are familiar with the Canaanites and the Israelites and all these other biblical stories, but are not familiar with what's going on? Right. Um, yeah, that's really a, a good question. Um, you know, um, for me, as uh, uh, first as a person, uh, it's, I mean, there is lots of anger. Uh, and the, the question is what to do with this anger. Uh, and for me, the best way to deal with this anger is uh, to channel it into advocacy. Uh, and this is what I do <laughs> almost 24-7. A D. So, uh, so I mean, this is I think my uh, my tenth webinar this week alone, uh, and I think alone in this week I give maybe over fifty interviews to all different kinds of uh, media uh, outlets, and and so this is how I try to to tell the story of my people because I think this is the most important thing, you know. Our, our, our problem uh, really was that uh, our story was silence. Uh, our narrative is not known. Uh, uh, and even now in the social media, there was a study that came out just uh, out today uh, showing how uh, even on Meta and uh, many other uh, social platforms, the Palestinian voice uh, actually uh, is... Uh, it's being uh, chucked uh, by, by the media and silenced. Uh, so that's what we experience, and this is why telling our story, and the human story especially, uh, is really important. Now I come to the second point, which is uh, the biblical story. You know, the biblical story, uh, and now it's, it's Christmas time, uh, so maybe I can take, uh, uh, take Christmas as an example. Uh, you know, I mean, you live in the U.S., um, and Christmas is about the reindeer and the white Christmas and the uh, jingle bells and so on. Nothing of that has to do with the real Christmas story. I mean, this is a commercialized society. It's a consumer society, and it's an entertainment society. In fact, uh, I, I, I read a study about uh, the... Uh, most of the American Christmas songs, uh, they had nothing to do with Jesus. I mean, think of Jingle Bells or think of, I mean, it's, it talks about something totally, and they were not written by Christians, actually. It's very interesting. Uh, it's an entertainment. While if we take the Christmas story uh, and we read it in today's context, you think this story is coming uh, is, is written just now in Gaza. Uh, because in the West, they were reading uh, the Bible through the lens of the empire. We read the Bible through the lens of the people of Palestine. And remember, the Bible uh, did not originate in the Bible Belt, right? Uh, thanks God. I mean, the Bible uh, really uh, is a product that came out of Palestine. I always like to tease uh, my American friends and to tell them, you know, in the back of the Bible, there is a stamp saying made in Palestine. People forget that, right? Uh, uh, so, so let's read, you know, the Christmas story because we are in the Christmas season. Uh, you hear about a family from Nazareth, which is north of Palestine, ordered by an imperial decree to evacuate and to go register in the south in Bethlehem. Does it sound familiar? It's a Gazan story today. And then you have the pregnant uh, Mary uh, on the run. Uh, imagine her journey from the north to the south, which is a journey that 50,000 Palestinian pregnant women in Gaza right now are uh, going through. Uh, and they arrive in Bethlehem as, as displaced people, as refugees, uh, and there is no place uh, at the end. Uh, you know, 
where uh, should uh, Mary deliver? Uh, at the end of the day, Jesus is put in a manger. Uh, because in Gaza today, you know, uh, hospitals are out of service. 300,000 buildings are totally destroyed. So all these people are in the streets, you see them, or in tents. And this is where today uh, the children, uh, the newborn children in Gaza are, are coming to the world. Uh, and then you have the story of King Herod, who, uh, to stay in power, ordered to uh, massacre uh, the, the children in Bethlehem. And we have actually uh, a chapel in Bethlehem uh, for the innocent uh, murdered children. Uh, guess 8,000 uh, Gazan children have been murdered uh, in this uh, atrocity just for Netanyahu to stay longer in power, like Herod. Uh, and then you have the, the, the song of the, of, the, uh, of the angels, glory to God in the highest peace on earth, which is actually, uh, it's uh, a critique of the empire because it says glory belongs to, to the almighty, not to the mighty, to the almighty, not to the mighty. And that uh, peace is not the Pax Romana. It's not the peace that the Roman Empire wanted to bring by subjugating nations uh, and uh, by military oppression, but it is the peace that is based on human dignity, equality, uh, and justice. And so if you read the story this way through the lens of Palestine, who has been living through all of these, you know, occupations uh, under imperial rule, it starts making sense. But what the West, the empire, transformed this, spiritualized it, and commercialized it, so it became out of context. But for us, actually, uh, it is uh, it's a very, very important. This is why when... When I read the Bible, we need to liberate the Bible from this uh, Western occupation. It's not only that our land was occupied, it's our B Bible also is occupied by the empire. Uh, and this is what I try to, to, to write uh, about in my book, Decolonizing Palestine. This is just one, one example. Mitri, if I can follow up on that, on just going back to Osama, part of Osama's question has to do with, you know, here in the U.S., when we, when we encounter so-called Christian Zionists, um, and I reserve the right to call them so-called because to me there seems to be a disconnect between between Zionism and, and what I understand Christianity to be, but which we could talk about. But just there seems to be, a, I mean, first of all, a disconnect in the sense that there's a there's a almost total lack of awareness of Palestinian Christians as a whole, not just a group among other Palestinians. I mean, Palestine has always been, as Osama and other people have taught us, you know, an ecumenical community historically. So Christians played a, have always played an important role in Palestine culturally and so forth. Christians have played a, a very important role intellectually and politically in the Palestinian struggle. We can name very prominent Palestinian Christians who've been major figures in the Palestinian struggle. But first of all, so my first question, I guess, is Palestinian Christians seem to drop out of the picture in, in a kind of amazing way. People in America, for example, when when it comes up at all, it's always sort of, we need, on the question of Palestine, we need to attend to what they call here anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And like Palestinian Christians drop out of the picture entirely. So let's talk a little bit about Palestinian Christians. And then secondly, this you know, let's ultimately work our way towards the the not just the misreading of the bible but the whole kind of this whole status of a kind of culture of what i will call so-called christian zionism and I, so those are two kind of broad areas of uh, of discussion yeah uh, thank you yeah i mean you know the palestinian christian community is uh, as old uh, as the uh, you know, as the uh, New Testament. It's a 2,000-year uh, history. Uh, I mean, again, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Palestine, not in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, and for the last uh, 2,000 years, there has been a Christian, a very vital Christian presence in this country. 
So we are not converts from Islam. Uh, on the contrary, this is where our roots are. Um, so my family uh, goes back, you know, uh, to ancient history in Bethlehem, actually. We are, we are Bethlehemite. This is where our roots uh, are. Uh, so, and I think this story, uh, indeed, uh, is not known abroad. This is why one of my first books uh, was called I'm a Palestinian Christian. Just to connect being Palestinian and being Christian was like, wow, a revelation for people abroad. Uh, for us, it's like something that's the natural. I mean, you know, this is where it's all started. Uh, uh, you know, the first missionaries did not come from the mission west, uh, from the uh, Midwest. Uh, so it, it's all started here. Uh, and as you said, Christians have been playing a major role and are still playing a major role. You know, we did uh, uh, a study four years ago about uh, the uh, Christian institutions active today in Palestine, uh, especially Gaza, West Bank, and East Jerusalem. There are around 300 of them. Guess what? We found out that if we take them together, they constitute the third largest employer in Palestine. After, I mean, the country, the government is the first largest employer. The second largest is the UNRWA, the UN uh, Relief and Work uh, organizations uh, active in the refugee camp. And then uh, church-related organizations, they employ around 10,000 people, though Christians in the West Bank and Gaza are less than 50,000, but they employ 10,000. And then when we looked at the health sector, uh, Christian uh, institutions run one third of the health services uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, people now heard about Al Ahli Hospital in Gaza, a Christian hospital. Uh, uh, the educational, uh, in the educational sector, uh, we have over 100 uh, Christian schools. Uh, we have two universities uh, and two colleges uh, that are Christian. Uh, uh, Birzeit University started as a Christian uh, university uh, uh, almost 100 years ago. So, I mean, uh, Christians continue and, uh, you know, everyone knows uh, one of your relatives, uh, like Edward Said, a Palestinian Christian, uh, 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 who really uh, uh, became very famous uh, uh, through working on Orientalism and uh, post-colonialism. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, we are part and parcel of the Palestinian people. Uh, and uh, we are not a minority because we are part of the majority, the Palestinians. Uh, uh, we are not a marginalized group. Uh, Christians are active in all sectors of the society. Um, and... Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we, our, our identity is, uh, you know, we are Arab, Palestinian, Christians, uh, uh, even secular. You know, I consider myself, though I'm a pastor, I consider myself to be more on the secular spectrum uh, of, of the society. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's all these multiple identities that we carry uh, uh, with us. Now, regarding your second question about Christian Zionism, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, the Bible, uh, uh, I describe it often as the, the bazaar in the old city of Jerusalem. Now, I'm not sure if you have been there, but uh, you have been, I'm sure, maybe also in Lebanon, in, in bazaars and so on. You can find almost everything. Um, so if you want texts that uh, talks about uh, settler colonialism, it is there. You go to the book of Joshua. And Netanyahu was able to find it because, you know, he talked about Amalek. When, when he announced that the Israeli troops are entering Gaza, uh, he he quoted First Samuel fifteen three, where God is telling Saul, "Go in uh, and uh, kill everyone. Don't spare anyone. 
men, women, elderly people, children, ox and sheep. And this is exactly what, what Netanyahu is doing. This is exactly what Israeli military are doing. Uh, and it's not by chance that uh, Netanyahu quoted the Bible to actually uh, for this genocide. If you want uh, to find uh, in the Bible texts of liberation, uh, of justice, it's there. You know, you go to the prophets. You go to the teaching of Jesus. So what you find in the Bible does not say a lot about the Bible, but it says about you. And so the Christian uh, Zionists are actually, if you look carefully, these are, if, if I talk now about the Christian Zionists in the States, actually they are uh, American Christian nationalists. This is their religion. And they weaponize the Bible towards that goal. This is their identity. And this identity, I called it in my book, the meta-narrative for them, stands above the Bible. So then they find the verses that fits their uh, uh, national uh, religious identity. It's a very dangerous, you know, once you start, uh, 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 you know, blending religion with nationalism, it's very, very dangerous. It's dangerous in Judaism, it's dangerous in Christianity, and it's dangerous in Islam. But just quickly, Mitri, on that, on that particular, sorry, Karim, on that particular question, because it's it, so, as somebody, so I, I, my scholarship is on the poet William Blake, the poet and artist who was a profound Christian thinker, of course, of the ultimate, I think, radical variety, interested in liberation and freedom and equality and justice and fighting against the empire of his own time. Um, what, but what strikes me about these, these so-called Christian Zionists in the U.S. is that they seem to, I mean, as you're saying, they, they cherry pick what they, what they want from the Bible. They seem to have an obsession with the most sort of violent bits of the Old Testament, and then they seem to fast forward to the to Revelation. And all, to, what's striking to me is, as somebody who comes at this from my own, from our family, our collective, my brothers and I family background, and and obviously also from my reading of Blake. You know, what's striking is that they all the parts about Jesus they seem to they seem to skip all that. You know, which is the parts about love and forgiveness and sharing and equality which animates somebody like Blake and animates many in our family too is, you know, if not theologically, then at least as matters of moral principle and political principle as well. It's a, it, to me, it's amazing to see how they just skip all the, like they don't, they never seem to be interested in what Jesus has to say, which I always find just particularly ironic. Sorry, Karim, you were going to ask something. No, I don't know if Mitchell wants to respond to that uh, directly. No, I, I agree. Uh, I agree. And I think they are, uh, anxious for Armageddon. This is why they love wars, yeah. you know. And actually, deep down, if you look at it, they are the most anti-Semitic people. Why? Because they want to bring all the Jews to Palestine so that two-thirds of them will be killed in this Armageddon, and the last third will convert to Christianity. So they are calling for the annihilation of the Jewish people. This is what they are calling for. But Netanyahu, uh, you know, has no problem to share bed with them, not out of love, but to fulfill their, uh, uh, you know, ugly desires. Yeah, I, I, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of push a little bit on this question. Um, so first, if you could clarify this question of the Israelites in the Bible, what, what they are as opposed to the kind of the modern day Israelis and to, you know, to make that connection, uh, just because to me, sometimes it's not clear. I'm sure to a lot of people, it's not clear. And then this kind of claim of, uh, the second and kind of related to this, uh, and you know, you were talking about the rapture and the Armageddon and and this kind of annihilation and this a lot of this vengeful kind of Old Testament kind of stuff. I, I'm very curious about how it is that how and I think I've heard you speak before about Palestine being kind of the the ultimate melting pot where there's this coexistence. Psalm was written about coexistence. So this long history of coexistence in our area, in fact, our region, through the Christianity and through, through other religions as well in our region, uh, in the Meshit region anyway. And as opposed to these modern day Christian Zionists, uh, are, as you say, they're kind of nationalists, very, you know, and the settler colonial Zionist Israeli kind of state. So these two very ethnic, very nationalist, very exclusionist, 
versus Palestine and Palestinians and our region as this kind of a melting pot of coexistence network. I wonder if you could just clarify this a little bit. Yeah, yeah, maybe two things. Let me say two things. I hope I, I can answer your question. The first thing is uh, in my other book, uh, Faith in the Face of Empire, uh, uh, I tried actually, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm so far maybe the only theologian or the first theologian to work on this, reading the Bible through a geopolitical lens. So the hermeneutical key for the Bible for me is the geopolitical lens, which means I cannot read the Bible without doing a political and socio-political analysis. Uh, and for me, the Bible actually, if you look at the oldest uh, texts there, are maybe 3,000 years old, the oldest, oldest. Guess what? This is exactly the same time that empire emerged in our region. And so actually the, the Bible for me was uh, a kind of what Ghassan Kanafani, the, Palest the Palestinian poet, called literature of resistance. This is how I read the Bible. It's a literature of resistance. It's not a literature of settler colonialism. And so, uh, uh, and the question of God is very much connected to the question of empire. Why? Because the empire behave, behaves like God. They are omnipotent. They have all their military equipment uh, and might. They have all their economical uh, 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 wealth. Uh, they have all their media and cultural control. And when you are occupied by an empire, you know, this triggers the question about God. God, where are you? I mean, this is the question of people in Gaza, you know, I mean, <laughs> God, where are you? Uh, I mean, why can't you stop this atrocity? And this is why, actually, if you come to the teaching of Jesus, uh, at the heart of Jesus' message was he came to proclaim what we call the kingdom of God, but this is not uh, gender neutral. So the reign of God. And the reign of God is the answer to the empire. The empire that comes with military uh, subjugation and the kingdom of God that is based on justice. Now, this brings me to answer your question about the Israelites. The Israelites on the Bible are one section of the Palestinian people of that time that were fighting the empires. Assyrian, Babylonian, uh, Persian, Greek, Roman. These are the empires actually in the Bible. Uh, and so fast forward, we should not connect the Israelites of the Bible with the Israel of today, but rather from a geopolitical uh, aspect, it's the Palestinians of today that they share a similar context like the Israelites of the Bible. And so if we want to understand the Bible, for me, we have to listen to the Palestinian voices because they live, as I showed in, in, the, in, the, in the story of Christmas, uh, they, uh, they, they still share that story. So it's not like, so this is the first uh, thing I wanted to say. The other thing, uh, you are right. And I think, you know, Osama is the, uh, you know, the, the great uh, uh, thinker who wrote, you know, The Age of uh, Coexistence, uh, which I love. And, uh, and I think this is exactly uh, what we need. So, so Palestine was always, always a, a pluralistic society. There was never, ever one, uh, one group of people that was able to control or like one religion or it was always diverse, always uh, pluralistic. And so uh, as Palestinians, we don't have problems with the Jews. Judaism uh, was part uh, and is part of Palestine. Uh, Christianity is part, has been part of Palestine and is Islam as well. And we have others, you know, we have Druze and we have, uh, you know, many other, uh, um, so our problem is not with the Jews uh, because they are part of, for me, 
I mean, the idea of a Palestinian Jew, uh, I mean, Jesus is a Palestinian Jew, is not a contradiction. Today we think this is a contradiction. No, not at all. The, the Jews of Palestine were sharing our, uh, our history, our story. They were part of us. They weren't part of the empire. Our problem became when actually the empire, 19th century British empire, decided to use the Jews of Europe as subcontractors for the empire. And this is why today, if you look at the atrocity in Gaza, our problem is not only with Israel. It's the empire. And this is why Khaldi in his book about the, the hundred year war on Palestine, our you know, I mean, what, what Russia is right now, since two years in Ukraine, uh, is facing the Western Empire. We as Palestinians, we have been facing this empire for the last hundred years. And I think uh, Israel is so crazy now because they are realizing even after a hundred years, they couldn't get rid of us. The Palestinian sumud, the steadfastness, the resilience, the resistance, became something of our DNA because <laughs> we have this long history with empires. And, um, uh, you know, in one of my books, in, in Faith of the Face of Empire, I, I said, uh, you know, when you hear the verse of Jesus, uh, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. I mean, I thought Jesus is crazy. It doesn't make sense to me because the meek is not the one. Uh, but if you read this, through a long durée, you know, empires came and they weren't able to stay. It's the people, it's the, it's the poor people. Even, you know, those educated and rich people, they go to the empire, you know. It's really the poor people, they stay behind and they inherit the earth. So again, reading it through, uh, through the lens of the people of the land, the Palestinians, uh, it's amazing. Uh, because it makes sense. Could, could I follow up, Mitri, on this? Sorry, can I just, a quick question on this. So it, by extension, can we understand the, you know, what I see, I, I, unless I miss something, the kind of absence, at least very public absence of Christian solidarity with Palestinians. I mean, Christian outside of, of, of the measure anyway, as those institutions and leaders lining up with empire as opposed to with fellow Christians. I mean, is, is this how it is? Are the, the Western churches and even the other churches that I would say, even the Orthodox churches, I don't know, I haven't heard very much. Uh, the Pope, I mean, okay, now he's maybe a little bit beginning here and there to say some things, but it's taken forever. How do you, I mean, I you know, without wanting to, how does one assess the lack of empathy and lack of, of, of feeling of being outraged as a human, as a Christian human, as a humanist, the Christian humanist, let's say, uh, you know, especially as, as you were saying earlier with the, with the lessons of Jesus and, uh, and, and, and the kind of those lessons that Jesus teaches us and, uh, and the suffering that's there, in addition to the fact that Palestine being the land of Christ over, you know, coming towards Christmas time, this total absence or near absence of outrage and and discussion. How, how do you explain this? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, West, many of the Western churches, not all of them, uh, are hostage of the empire. Uh, um, and, um, you know, I, I showed this for as, as one example uh, in, uh, in my book uh, about the politics of persecution, where I quote Osama, a lot in, in that book, um, and I give I, I give many examples how this happened. But uh, let me here mention one, which is in the First World War, uh, when Germany uh, was uh, aligned with the Ottoman Empire, and at that time the 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 emperor the 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 German emperor was not only the political head of Germany, but also actually the head of the church. Uh, and he ordered, he himself ordered, uh, when the Armenians 
uh, were experiencing genocide, not to raise this issue at all, because this is against the interest of Germany. And so the church in Germany, as well as the government, they stayed silent and they allowed 1.5 million Armenians to be massacred by the Ottomans. Uh, this is one example uh, uh, that shows you actually what's going on. Uh, however, having said that, uh, uh, I'm glad that there are churches uh, in the States, uh, for example, who are very vocal. The Presbyterian Church, UCC, Disciples, uh, to some extent, Lutherans and, and uh, uh, Methodists. Uh, uh, these are the mainline churches, and, but they don't have political teeth. That's the problem. The political teeth is with the Christian Zionists because the Christian Zionists uh, are very much in bed with the Israel lobby. And so their voice and their political uh, is, is amplified. Uh, this is really our problem with uh, with the churches uh, and we need to keep challenging them and this is what uh, you know I try to do uh, but sometimes you know I mean to tell you the truth we are also upset with our own uh, Christian leadership here in Jerusalem you know uh, I mean yesterday for example they they met with the Israeli uh, president and had uh, had a picture with him and uh, breakfast with him, while that same guy, you know, said, uh, you know, let's destroy Gaza, not leave stone on stone. I mean, yeah, I will stop because I otherwise, I, I if I if I start there, I... well, I was going to ask you, Mitri, why why would they do that? But um, we can come back to that. You can try to answer that question a little later, since you don't want to get into those those details. But I, I have a question following up from what Karim and, and what Sadi was asking earlier. Um, there's a story that you have in the in your book, uh, a narrative, a vignette of this experience you had in and this brings us to the question of how you respond and how we should respond or how people should respond. There's a vignette where you talk about a German theologian, a famous liberal German theologian by the name, if I'm not mistaken, of Mark Marquardt or um, Marquardt, who, yes. Yeah, who came to Jerusalem in the 1980s um, and gave you a lecture, gave you, a Palestinian, native, Christian, a lecture about how you should leave the country uh, and get up because you stand, you as a Palestinian Christian stand in God's way because this belongs to the Jewish people, he told you. And I'm wondering, given that, I mean, it's, just, it's an extraordinary story that you tell, I mean, and how you were shocked by it and, and how anyone, honestly, anyone who's not, um, who's, who doesn't believe in this Christian Zionism would also be shocked by it. But how do you respond? And, and this is the question that we've been asking in a sense, and we keep hearing, how do you respond to people when they tell you these things? And when, for example, the Christian Zionists today or, or the Germans, for example, talking about we have to atone for the Holocaust, you know, uh, and deal with the history of Western anti-Semitism. How do you deal with that? And how do you tell them? And how do you think words matter? Or do you think they? Do you think you have an effect when you? How, how, I'm really thinking about the the emotional and intellectual response to these kinds of provocations. Honestly, yeah, yeah. You know, Marquardt actually presented a different uh, br uh, blend. Uh, of uh, Christian Zionism. It's not like the American blend of these crazy evangelicals. Uh, actually, Marquardt himself was a socialist, uh, very liberal on everything except on Palestine. And so when he told me after a panel discussion, uh, you stand guard in the way, if I wear you, I will pack my luggage and go and leave this land to its uh, right uh, owners, meaning the Israeli, uh, uh, actually, he thought he's doing God a favor, he's doing the Israeli a favor. In my book, uh, I, 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 I explain that this blend, actually, the meta-narrative there is the Holocaust. And, uh, and guess what? Markwad himself was serving in the Nazi Germany as a soldier. 
So he did that to the Jewish people in Germany. And now he is trying to show himself as the big supporter of Israel to make up for what he did there. Asking us to pay the price for their sins. And I always tell the Germans, if you want to do atonement, great, you should, but not on our cost. Uh, 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 because then you are actually uh, doing not only one sin, you are doing two sins. But with time, I came to realize something else. I came to realize that actually uh, these theologians, uh, and, and again to the question actually of Karim about the churches, many of these churches and theologians and people, uh, they like to side with those in power. So they sided against the Jews in Nazi Germany because they were not the one in power. Uh, they sided against the Armenians because they were not the one in power. They are siding against the Palestinians because we are not one in power. So because they are, they want to be on the side of the powerful. Uh, and this is where they feel uh, actually their place is. And again, I come back to geopolitics. Jesus was not siding with those in power, but with those powerless. And so the church in that sense loses actually uh, its calling and it loses its essence uh, when they side with those in power. And this is why we need always to call them to that. Uh, uh. So just to, to, to follow up in terms of an intellectual, but what's the, I mean, so you're, you're, how do you, do you try to argue with them, Mitri? Because my question is, you're, you're talking about people who fundamentally don't see you as relevant historically, ethically, uh, let alone theologically. They don't see you as, you as, in other words, Palestinians, right. Right. as relevant, uh, not just you as an individual. So how do you, my question is, do you argue with them or do you think we should not be addressing them? We should be addressing other people, younger generations, or, or how do you, do you see what I'm saying? How it's, it's, right. they seem to be set in their way and nothing is going to change them. Right, right. You know, I mean, uh, the, there is a group of Christian Zionists that I think it's a waste of time to engage with them. Uh, they are lost. It's a hopeless case. Sorry to say that. But but there are certain segments that uh, it makes sense to, uh, to talk to them. Uh, if I take the U.S. as an example, uh, among young evangelicals, uh, there is a change. Uh, they are very much open. Uh, in fact, yesterday I had a webinar with them. Uh, why uh, are they open? Because they discover justice as uh, an important element of Christianity and of their faith. Uh, not, you know, all of these other things, uh, sin that, uh, and they asked me yesterday a lot about sin, uh, because they were obsessed with this, you know, their, under, their spiritualized understanding of sin. While I told them, for me, yes, sin, we talked about it. It's about the structural oppression. Uh, this is what we need to talk about. This is the sin. So, so when we talk about the U.S., these young people are, are starting, their eyes are opening, uh, becoming more and more realizing that, you know, justice, social justice is important. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is happening to the African-American, this is very much has to do with the gospel. What's happening to the uh, Native American is something that has to do with the gospel. So they are starting to realizing the importance of social justice and justice. And if you need, if you are looking for one example uh, where the whole issue is about justice, it's Palestine. Uh, here you have the issue of justice very dense, like in no other place. Uh, here in Palestine, you have settler colonialism, you have uh, racism, you have orientalism, you have apartheid, 
uh, uh, you have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Islamophobia. I mean, you know, all of it is concentrated in Palestine. And right now, people in Germany is, are projecting all of this into, in, into us, and they hate us. And, uh, and so I stopped giving interviews to German newspapers because, you know, it's really a hopeless case. Uh, but there are other certain segments where, uh, where it makes sense and we should really work hard uh, to tell our story. And I think people who are of good faith and who have an open uh, heart and open eyes and open ears, uh, they will they will change and i saw in my you know in my life so many people changing so many people changing so the first time i went to the states uh, was back in 1991 people even didn't know that there are palestinian christians today churches in the us as i said are very articulate uh, you know i'm invited to speak at so many places by so many different groups of people. Uh, so, yes, uh, but but we have to do something about it. Change will not come from heaven uh, uh, down to us. Uh, it has to be bottom up, and we are called uh, to do something about it. And I think this is exactly what Jesus was saying, that he preached about the reign of God, but he told these uh, marginalized people in, of Palestine at that time, you know, you are the ambassadors of this kingdom. You are called to make the difference. Nobody else will do it unless you do it. That's a very, we're, we're going to wrap soon. That's a, so, a very powerful okay. sort of way to, to end. Kenyon, do you have a question? Do you want to jump yeah, in? I, I wanted to ask, and we've been talking about uh, the West and the U.S., uh, I'm in Beirut, and I wanted, you know, you had mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, some of the the Palestinian churches in Jerusalem and others. Um, what about the larger Christian Eastern Christian setup here, and whether there has been some kind of solidarity coming within this region, within the churches from here, uh, or how, how does that work? Or is there not that kind of expectation? Or, you know, you know. So the the relationship, in a sense, that that I'm understanding from you, is that many of the the big churches, the established ones, that are connected to Christian Zionism and connected to kind of American politicians and European politicians, these people serve the empire as opposed to Christianity per se. What about the Eastern Christians? Is it the same apply? I mean, are we? Are they connected to empires that are here, or even the Western empires, or or is this also at an individual pastor level, individual uh, yeah. church level. Uh, Amitri, just if I could add to Karim's question too, is to, to, I mean, to, to double down in a way, it, specifically, for example, the, the Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, after all, St. Por Porphyrius Church was bombed in Gaza, right? A couple of few right. weeks ago. The Armenian, the Armenian Church, you know, with, given what's happening in, with the Armenian community in Jerusalem, for example, the, dis the ramped up dispossession and violence against the Armenian community. So those kinds of churches too, it's such, and of course the Arab churches as well. So it's, I think, I think, I don't know if, if you meant the, the, all of the East as opposed to the Arab world specifically, but I would also want to know what about the Armenian church? What about the Greek Orthodox church? What do they have to say and why, what, how can we understand their silence? Are, are they also, you know, on the side of empire in that sense? Yeah. You know, again, I think it's uh, 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 there is a, a big spectrum uh, within the churches in the West, but also in our region. Um, if I take, for example, Lebanon, since uh, uh, Karim, you mentioned it. I mean, last Monday, uh, they uh, uh, there was in Palestine, they uh, called for a, a day of mourning and strife. Uh, and uh, in Lebanon, actually, uh, people went on strike in support of Palestine. Uh, so you could see that there is something. In, in, many, of, in many of the Arab states, uh, you see people actually are uh, marching where, where they are allowed to march. 
they are marching on the streets. In some countries, they are not allowed to march in support of Palestine. Uh, and uh, uh, they are in the Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, we 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 miss uh, like Greek Orthodox leaders like George Hudor, the Bishop George Hudor in Lebanon. Uh, he was a great theologian, very outspoken on Palestine. Uh, 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 he worked on Islam. Osama knows that, I think, very well. Uh, I mean, so 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 there are these voices, but also there are the other voices uh, 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 that, uh, because of what happened, if I take Lebanon again as an example, because of what happened. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, maybe there are some sensibilities. Uh, uh, I mean, there is uh, now in the last uh, few weeks, because I was so outspoken on Gaza, uh, uh, there was one from uh, from those uh, Lahid uh, people, you know, those uh, southern Lebanon who were uh, collaborating with Israel, who was attacking me on daily basis on social media. So, I mean, you have also these voices, uh, definitely, uh, uh, because in this case, he works for the empire, uh, collaborator with Israel. So, yeah, so so we have all of this. Uh, uh, we should not lose hope. Uh, in fact, uh, when I see all the people who are pouring into the streets uh, in so many uh, uh, countries, uh, I see that humanity is still alive. Uh, I see, uh, you know, these especially young people are ready to speak up for for justice, uh, and so I really uh, that gives us lots of hope, including uh, many Jewish groups like uh, Jewish Voices for Peace or uh, Not in My Name and others. Uh, because if you believe in justice, irrespective of what your religion is, Palestine is the issue that you have to take on. Mitri, thank you for that. For that, um, I'd like to wrap with with two final questions um, okay. because I agree with you in terms of uh, we're almost end. We're, we're at the hour, but uh, I agree with you, of course, that there's a Jewish um, emancipatory tradition. There's an Islamic emancipatory tradition. Um, and and as you said, there's there's and Palestine is a moral compass for all these traditions, and and it's re revealing, so revealing in terms of what you're saying. So from that, the last questions we have are the questions of what is an ethical resistance, and a, a very difficult question would be about the question of violence and all that stuff. But uh, since you are a theologian and you are someone who's not just a theologian, you're also Palestinian. What is ethical resistance to you, and what message would you have at the end, since we're going to release this on Christmas Day, probably this podcast uh, or this episode, what message would you have for for individuals, um, as well as churches, but also individuals, institutions around the world about standing in solidarity? My sense is uh, that they could take a lot of messages from what you've said over the past hour, but specifically the the question of resistance what is ethical resistance to you i know that this could be another 10 hours but uh, how, and how would you close with with a a message for people what what should they do because a lot of people keep asking what can we do right right yeah uh, that's a, that's a very uh, important uh, and difficult question um uh, uh, for us um, uh it's important when we think of, of this question uh, to align it with international law. Uh, uh, to align it with, uh, with, with human rights uh, chart, but also to align it with uh, the, the heart of the gospel. Uh, I mean, in... Uh, in our document, the Kairos Palestine document, we talked about creative resistance. And uh, I mean, when I hear the news, say in the US, talking about uh, the right uh, of Israel to 
defend itself. I mean, the occupier tried to defend themselves. So what about our right to defend ourselves? And the international law answers that question. Uh, uh, for me personally, what what uh, what uh, what uh, I thought maybe the most powerful tool uh, uh, was to to establish a university uh, with a focus on arts, culture, and design. Uh, for me, that is maybe uh, the most important aspect of resistance. I mean, look now like one uh, one image of Jesus, uh, of this crash with Jesus and the rubble uh, was much more powerful than many other things. When I see the films that our students are producing, uh, uh, telling our story, the human story, uh, much more powerful than many other things. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, how can we? Uh, for me, the the you know the the mission became uh, basically to educate the next generation of creative leaders for Palestine, who can communicate our story, and not that just through political uh, slogans, uh, but through new creative mediums that are uh, today uh, through a post, through a small video. Uh, you can uh, uh, touch uh, hearts and minds of people like no other thing. So for me, that was the answer I found for myself. Uh, and, and I'm so proud of our students. Uh, and again, coming back to Gaza, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I went there the first time where after 20 years, I was banned from going there by Israel. So the, the, the first time I went there, I met three young artists. I came back to Bethlehem, and within two weeks, over 200 young artists from Gaza added me on Facebook. And they were telling me, you know, come, we need you in Gaza, uh, because we need just uh, space, uh, space and skills to be able to tell our story the best way. And so for me, that was really uh, the answer. Uh, so how what can people do? Uh, Usually I say five things. Uh, they are the five Ps that I, I like. The first, as a pastor, I, I say pray. Uh, uh, we need your prayers. Uh, uh, though a sister in Gaza, a sister, a, a Catholic sister told me, stop praying. <laughs> we need more than praying. This is why we cannot stop there with the, with the one P. Because I hear many Christians telling me, you know, we're praying for you, praying for you. I say Great, but praying alone is not enough. So the second P is political advocacy. It is very important for people in the States uh, to write their representative. I, I have friends who are writing their representative and even President Biden on a daily basis. It's important because when, whenever I go to Congress, they tell me, you know, uh, your people, they come here maybe twice a month the Israel lobby are here almost on a weekly basis. So they need to hear that there are people who care for Palestine. But again, that's also not enough. We need part of the advocacy to go to the streets, to march in the streets, and to demand, to demand justice, to demand ceasefire, to demand a just peace. So that's the second P. The third P uh, are uh, pilgrimages but not to come here to run where Jesus walk, but to come on a solidarity visit. Right now, actually, we have uh, a South African delegation uh, on a solidarity visit to Palestine and to the people in Gaza. Uh, tomorrow, we are having a joint service together with them. Very important, because once you see the wall, once you see the Jewish colonies, once you see uh, the checkpoint and what we have to endure on a daily basis, uh, eyes uh, would open immediately. Uh, the fourth P are products. Uh, it's important to buy products uh, that are made in Palestine. You have agricultural products, you have uh, uh, now for Christmas uh, ornaments, uh, 
coming out of Bethlehem, you have uh, books uh, to read, books that are written by uh, Palestinian uh, authors or on Palestine. Uh, yeah, we need people to uh, to to have uh, uh, you know to buy Palestinian products. Uh, and the fifth is uh, pick a project to support. Uh, it could be a scholarship. Uh, for a student in Gaza, it could be, you know, uh, uh, something for uh, uh, a displaced person uh, in Gaza. It could be, I mean, something tangible where where, where you share this. And my last, uh, my message uh, to the to the world today on Christmas, uh, you know, Bethlehem gave. Jesus to the world. I think it's high time for the world to give a just peace to Bethlehem, to Gaza, to Palestine. Thank you so much, Matu. This was uh, this was really, uh, really genuinely inspiring. And I just based on that, I just wonder what does what does Christmas in Bethlehem how will it be? I mean, what, uh, what is... Uh, yeah, please. I mean, churches decided to cancel all Christmas celebration, all the packaging and the festivities and the glamour and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, what we will do, for example, tomorrow, uh, our university and few other civil societies, um, we are uh, actually inaugurating a large scale uh, uh, manger uh, with 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 this with a destroyed a uh, building on Manger Square uh, with the family holy family in the rubble there, but it's a huge scale and the one that you see in the so this is going to be inaugurated tomorrow uh, and then uh, there will be five children. Uh, uh, sending uh, love messages from the children of Bethlehem to the children in Gaza, uh, live uh, on air. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, there will be uh, huge uh, uh, banners uh, in black cloth uh, with white writing on them. Uh, uh, talking about Gaza, uh, uh, there, uh, 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 there will be a, a service, as I said, uh, uh, with, with our African, uh, South African friends. It's going to be uh, uh, broadcasted live uh, on, on, on 20 different uh, social platforms. And so again, it, it's, it's a creative ways of telling the Christmas story, but also our mourning as Palestinians uh, at this time uh, of the year. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of the even American uh, uh, channels are going to show some of that. Mitri, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, in the circumstances, we, of course, wish you all the best. And we would say we pray, but you know, given what you said, uh, we, we um, hope that you're well and you stay well. And of course, that justice comes to Palestine this Christmas or or as soon as possible. We wishing you all the well, uh, all the best. Thank you again for all that you're doing. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, uh, but the most important thing is seeing both the three of you. So, guys, I think uh, that was a, a, an incredible episode, honestly, uh, incredibly moving, incredibly powerful testimony and witness uh, of Mitri Rahib, um, who, of course, is in Palestine, in, Be in Bethlehem. Uh, I was, I was, um, at first, there was an element of despair. And then by the end, you know, again, our spirits are have to be in solidarity with everyone there. And what do you think? Um, I think he spoke very eloquently to the, this question of of speaking about uh, speaking against empire. And so in our previous podcast, we talked about or Elon talked about the business of 
global Israel and global Palestine. And here, really, it's about it's it's uh, and Karim, you were saying earlier, it's no longer the global south, global north doesn't make sense anymore uh, as actual geography. So, do you want to just to we wrap on that point? I think that's an important point. Yeah, I think I, 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 it's it's quite interesting. I think uh, when he started, especially as we're coming to Christmas, I think he started this idea of retelling the story of Christmas as a kind of parable of Gaza, Gaza, what's going on now. I thought that was really, really interesting. And this business of empire versus, uh, you know, sort of the Christian Zionists and others taking the side of the big institutions, taking the states, taking the side of empire versus the the, the kind of poor people in the, in the biblical tradition and in, in the Palestinian tradition and uh, Jesus himself being sort of fighting against the empire. I think that's really, you know, quite was uh, I found quite profound in that sense. And I suppose that's that's what liberation theology is all about, taking Jesus in that sense of fighting against empire as opposed to uh, just you know, serving empire. Ser serving empire, exactly in that kind of sense. I yeah. thought that was really and and the second point and it related to that that I pushed him that I thought was really interesting was uh, precisely that Palestinians from the very beginning and Palestinian Christians from the very beginning is all about this, uh, this you know, what today you call diversity, but this kind of multicultural coexistence, you know, it, it, it's open for everybody. There is no one denomination or only one kind of person. It's diverse. It's, it's, it's people that are coming and going, groups that are coming and going. And there's always, and we see it here in Beirut and Lebanon, we have Christmas celebrations coming up. Uh, you see it's open to everybody, you know, everybody in Beirut and Lebanon, the idea of Christmas, that is, it's there, it's normal. Uh, so it's not something so strange, and it's uh, as opposed to this Christian Zionist nationalism that he was talking about, or as opposed to Zionism itself and the Israeli state, which is hell bent on ethnic cleansing, hell bent on imposing a certain fanatical interpretation, uh, uh, you know, of an ethno nationalist state uh, that's there. And I find this this I think is something that's not appreciated as much, you know, that something that even people in solidarity don't appreciate as much in, in terms of, we, we just don't understand it necessarily, even if we're living it, we don't really understand it, how important that tradition is. Yeah, and Sadie, do you want, do you, want do you have something to say also about our, our family tradition, so to speak? I mean, yeah, I couldn't help thinking as he was talking, you know, it was powerful. He was, it was very powerful, I think, as you said. But I also was thinking in terms of our own family history that, you know, our 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 mother's grandfather was the first arab pastor in in palestine our great grandfather on our father's side our name comes from the fact that he was a khuri he was a greek orthodox priest who went to jerusalem from lebanon came back to jerusalem as al khuri al maqdisi the 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 you know the priest of jerusalem the one who went to jerusalem on a pilgrimage so there's we have deep family ties to these questions too and Edward Said himself, who's our uncle, uh, this the the his work on secularism and and so you know he's known as a secular critic, and people often misread that word in the context of Edward's work to think about secular as opposed to religious. That's not that was never it for Edward, partly because of our own, which means his own family tradition, his own, you know, his own uh, uh, location in in Palestinian Christianity, you know, writ large as a, as a cultural and political process and intellectual formation, not a theological one, but secularism for Edward meant that what Mitri was talking about, it means the, 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 an interest in, in challenging orthodoxy and challenging power and challenging, uh, state, right. you know, religion and challenging, you know, empire, obviously above all, right. And speaking for the dispossessed, speaking for the downtrodden. So the exact, it really maps onto what Mitri was talking about you know, very neatly. And the last thing on in this connection is, there's obviously, uh, you know, Samba, you were saying this earlier, there's an ecumenical component to both what Edward talks about in secular, as opposed to, you know, uh, orthodox uh, culture. Uh, and then what Mitri was talking about, too, the, the this presence of a Palestinian, you know, Christianity, that's, that's an important part of a of a ecumenical fabric, as he was saying, that goes back, you know, through history, Palestine has always been I mean, you should be the one talking about this, Osama, but Palestine has always had this ecumenical, you know, frame to it. There's a, there's a, you know, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. That's that's what Palestine is. It it's what it's it's what it has always been. So I think it's important to see that 
in in this context against an other you know a, a violently exclusive state project a hundred percent and it's not just that it always was it always will be uh, almost certainly I mean and, and and the question of course is what he said was, if was Zionism, so interesting if we come to the end of Zionism as Elan Pape was talking about in the previous podcast, colonial I colonial Zionism needs to happen. Sure. I, yeah yeah absolutely but what he said what Mitri said is, is so interesting that the idea of cherry picking I mean the point is that the Bible or the Quran or 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 uh, Jewish religious texts all these things is the question of right it's all a question of which part are we going to emphasize which phrases are we going to emphasize and and what he said that struck me the most was it doesn't tell you anything about the Bible it tells you really about the person who's reading yeah. the Bible or reading the Quran or reading you know various texts like the Jewish theological it's amazing right this is this idea that that yeah. this has ultimately nothing to do at at one level at the most human level it has nothing to do with 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 religion as such it has to do with the interpretation of these texts and and the person of course doing these interpretations and i think on that note i think we should we should probably wrap this because it really was I, i'm still struck by how powerful his testimony is can him go ahead yeah just uh, just to connect what Sari is saying there i think you know he himself mitri says that he you know at one point he's saying I, i'm secular and so it's an interesting yeah, way to he's, say he's, he, he's the priest and he's also he's the pastor and he's saying I'm secular, and then of course he, you know, he explained it. But it's this, this precisely this way, meaning in that liberation theology way of interpreting Jesus as fighting empire and as a resistant person, and therefore we'll go back to the to the story of Hazi now and resisting this empire, which is not just the Israeli state, but the larger empire that's backing the Israeli state and all the other collaborators that go along with it. I think that's incredibly. Uh, important to emphasize in the theory of saying in our family we have this kind of connection and this will and the need to always resist these kinds of empires well wishing you all uh, i mean i wish we could all be together but uh you know i wish it, i wish it was christmas in a, in a better in a, in a better time but uh we'll keep going and uh, see you guys soon take care happy christmas happy christmas